Welcome back to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to help you become the best ER nurse you can be. So mastering emergency medications is key for new ER nurses. So today we're going to cover epinephrine, nitroglycerin, furosemide, amiodarone, deltiazem, propofol, and naloxone, giving you the key information that you must know as a new ER nurse to be safe and to provide efficient care. And after the video, if you want to continue learning, whether it's medications, emergency conditions, the ABCs, triage, and so forth, you can check out our resources. There is a discount code at the end of the video for the PDF bundle. Now, let's get started with epinephrine. So how does it work? It's an alpha agonist and beta agonist, right? So it's going to constrict blood vessels with the alpha agonist part of it, and it's going to increase the heart rate, increase contractility, and open up a little bit of the lungs, the bronchial, with the beta receptors that it has. So the main uses are going to be cardiac arrest, anaphylaxis, bradycardia, and hypotension. So for the uses, just think of how it works, right? It constricts blood vessels, it increases the heart rate, it increases contractility, and it can open up the lungs a little bit, right? By dilating bronchial smooth muscle. So that's why it's used in cardiac arrest, in anaphylaxis, bradycardia, and hypotension. With cardiac arrest, it is thought that it helps increase coronary perfusion and perfusion to the brain. So that's like one of the things that it, why it is used for cardiac arrest. Now, the dosing for anaphylaxis is 0.3 milligrams for adults. If it's a cardiac arrest, it's one milligram Q every three to five minutes. If it's a presser, every facility may have a different protocol. The common one that I've seen is 0 0.1 to 2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. As far as the infusion presser dosing, just make sure that you follow whatever your facility has. When it comes to a lot of the infusions, I made my own little batch card with all of the infusions from whatever facility I work at so that I know exactly what the start rate is, what they titrate by, and the dose ranges that they have at that facility so that I stay within the protocol. Now, when you're giving epinephrine, you're going to monitor for arrhythmias, for hypertension, for tachycardia, and for extravasation, right? The tachycardia, the hypertension, again, why? Because it works on alpha and beta receptors. It's going to increase the blood pressure. It's going to increase the heart rate. And you monitor for arrhythmias because anytime we're messing with how the heart works, there's always the possibility of us triggering some sort of arrhythmia. So you're going to keep an eye on that as well. Now, let's move on to nitroglycerin. So how does it work? It works by decreasing the preload, which makes it easy on the heart, right? It doesn't have to pump as it doesn't have to pump as uh, hard to get blood out and it doesn't get filled with so much blood that it makes it hard for it to squeeze. It also decreases pulmonary vascular congestion and it helps open up coronary arteries. So based on how it works, we have the uses, right? We have uh, CHF, we have STEMIs, we have hypertension. When it's related to cardiac issues, it can be used. As for the doses, we have a sublingual dose of 0 0.4 milligrams. We have a pace on the chest. That's why they order like a one inch or half inch pace on the chest. And we have an infusion. Again, for infusions, verify what your facility uses, but a common one is a start dose of 10 micrograms per minute to a max of 100 to 200 gram micrograms per minute. The main times I'm using the infusions in the ER, at least in my own practice, has been with CHF exacerbations with like when they come in really bad with really bad pulmonary congestion and we have them on the BiPAP, starting them on an infusion of nitroglycerin helps bring down the blood pressure, helps open up the pulmonary vascular so that they're not congested and all that, all that fluid isn't backing up into their lungs. Again, if you are giving this medication, nitroglycerin, make sure that you're monitoring for hypotension because it is, again, going to decrease the blood pressure. So you don't want to just keep giving it, keep giving it, keep giving it if the blood pressure keeps going down and down and down. And you're going to avoid it with medications like Viagra and so forth. Now, furosemide, how it works, it's a diuretic, it decreases the preload, it gets rid of fluid. The main use is going to be congestive heart failure and like pulmonary edema, of course. The dosing that you'll see is somewhere between 20 to 80 milligrams IV. You're going to monitor the patient's urine output. You're going to monitor for hypotension, again, because you're getting rid of fluid, you're decreasing the preload, and you're going to keep an eye on the electrolytes since it is going to be a diuretic and it can have effects on the electrolytes.
Now, amiodarone. How does it work? It's an antiarrhythmic. It stabilizes the heart, the heart's electrical activity by slowing AV node conduction and prolonging re repolarization. The uses are going to be ventricular fibrillation, VTAG, AFib, RVR. So these uses, right? It just rhythms where the heart is too irritated. So ventricular fibrillation, the heart is just quivering, right? It's just too irritated. The same thing with VTAG and with with AFib RVR, the heart is too irritated, beating too fast, or just not having a good perfusing rhythm. Plus, by slowing the conduction through the AV node and prolonging the repolarization, it calms it out. It kind of relaxes those cells so that it makes it less likely for these rhythms to persist. So for the dosing and a rest, you have 300 milligrams. And if needed, you have a redose of 150 milligrams. If it's an infusion, like always verify your own facilities infusions. But for the infusions, you have 150 milligrams IV over 10 minutes, and then you have one milligram per minute drip for six hours, and then you have 0 0.5 milligrams per minute for 18 hours. Some of the main things that you're going to watch for, at least in the acute setting in the ER when you're first giving it, is monitoring for hypotension and for bradycardia, right? Bradycardia, like we said, it helps relax everything. And while you're relaxing, another word for it is slowing things down. And if you give too much, you're not keeping an eye on it, they can go bradycardic and just get worse and worse. So monitor for the hypotension and for bradycardia as well. Now, Deltiazem, another very important medication for ER nurses that they need to master. So how does it work? It's a calcium channel blocker. It helps lower the heart rate by a slowing conduction through the AV node. Main uses are going to be atrial fibrillation. Oh, I spelled fibrillation wrong. My bad. With a rapid ventricular response. The dose is going to be 20 milligrams typically. It's going to be 0 0.25 mix per kg slow IV. But a lot of the times for adults, it ends up, it ends up just being 20 milligrams. Again, they'll always double verify medications, right? Especially the dosing. If they order 20 milligrams, what I'm doing typically beforehand, I'm going to repeat the blood pressure, make sure that it's okay. Um, and then I'll give the first 10 slow, and then I'll recheck the BP, see how they reacted. If everything's still okay, then I'll give the last 10 just to gauge how the patient will respond. Some of the things you're going to monitor for are hypotension and bradycardia, of course. If your patient is hypotensive prior to administering deltiazem, for example, a very rapid ventricular fibrillation, uh, then you can ask the providers, hey, can we start a liter of fluids? So that's ongoing while we're giving the medication. So as long as there's no big contraindication like uh, dialysis patients or already pretty bad CHF, most providers will say, yeah, just to help combat the hypotension, just so we somehow don't make it worse by giving deltaism. Now, propofol is next. So how does it work? It's a sedative hypnotic. It provides rapid sedation. Because of the sedation, it's going to be used for sedation for ventilated, intubated patients and for procedural sedation. If you're using, a, using it as an infusion for these ventilated patients, typically you're going to see 5 to 75 micrograms per kilogram per minute. If it's for procedural sedation, the providers are the ones that are going to be giving it. You as a nurse are not going to have scope to push this medication. So just make sure that the providers are the ones giving it, right? But you are going to be titrating it on the patients that do need sedation, like intubated patients. So you do need to be aware of it. You're going to monitor, again, for respiratory depression and for hypotension. If your patient's intubated, the vent's doing all the breathing for them, right? So with the propofol, that's just going to be for the for the sedation. But you do have to monitor for the hypotension. So when I start, hype, uh, when I start propofol, uh, after RSI for my patients, I set the BP to be Q5 minutes so that I can gauge how they're responding to the propofol. Uh, because you don't want you don't want to start, never check the BP, and the patient just went more hypotensive, more hypotensive, more hypotensive. If they are giving propofol for a procedural sedation, that's where that respiratory depression comes in, right? So that's where you're keeping an eye on their respiratory drive. You're keeping an eye on their entitled CO2. You're keeping an eye on good chest rise and fall just to make sure that they're not getting too, uh, that they're not having respiratory depression. Now, let's go over Narcan. So how does it work? It's an opioid antagonist. It reverses respiratory depression that happens as a result of essentially just taking too much uh, opioids or overdosing, right? The uses are going to be opioid overdose. The dosing is 0 0.4 to 2 milligrams IV. You have four milligrams intranasal, and that's typically going to be used, used outside in the public, in the field by EMS, police officers. It's been handed out to a lot of facilities so that they have it right. And then it's also it can also be used as an infusion for patients that are just took too much uh, and they're over 
that they overdose and the initial two milligrams IV help, but then they're still going down after it, right? So you're going to be doing an infusion for these type of patients. So you're going to monitor for improved and return of respiratory drive so that if it's not improving that you can give more or that it, let's say it improved with the first dose and then it's going back down, the patient's breathing is slowing, they're hypoventilating and so forth. You're monitoring for that so you know if you need to give more of the more of the medication. And another very important thing is that you're going to monitor for the agitation, confusion, and competitiveness that happens a lot of the time. So let's say a patient's coming in a little overdose, you give the Narcan and they wake up and they can be very combative and they can start swinging. So just be mindful of it and just be uh, ready to handle the agitation that can come from these patients after the fact. For example, there are I guess, ranges in the overdose. That's why some providers will say, hey, let's just try 0.4 milligrams and see how that goes. But if it's something like the patient's actively being bagged, you're going to be doing a two milligrams IV to get the best uh, response as soon as possible. Our ER Nurse Essentials book is your no-fluff guide to essential ER knowledge, such as triage, ABCs, advanced life support, and the most critical conditions, all in a clear, easy-to-understand format. Our PDF bundle includes the essentials book plus our charting guide to help you document quickly, safely, and with confidence. You'll also get our scenario book packed with realistic, high-pressure cases to sharpen your critical thinking and prepare you for the unexpected. Use discount code ERREADY15 to save on the bundle. The course goes even further. It comes with book downloads, video lessons, practice tests, and if you need specific advice, you can always reach out to me. And now let's go on to the question of the day. When using end tidal CO2 waveform, waveform capnography, what is a normal range and what is the significance of a rising level? Again, when using end tidal CO2 waveform capnography, what is the normal range and what is the significance of a rising level? And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.